Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone and welcome to this class. In this class, we are going to learn about the genital infections. Genital infections forms a major component of infections which we come across in our clinics most of the times and it is very important to know their etiology, the general approach to their lab diagnosis and some rapid test which we can perform on these cases to help the patient receive a specific therapy and to recover faster. Let us begin with today's class. At the end of this class, we will be able to learn about important genital infections and the differential diagnosis and a specific approach to the laboratory diagnosis of such infections. We are going to cover this topic by taking some examples of the cases which we come across and here we are going to learn the details about important genital infections, their causative agents, their morphology, pathogenesis and the steps for laboratory diagnosis. Let us consider this case came to us as a genital ulcer of 4 days duration. The patient gave the history of having unprotected sex uh, with the multiple partners and Patient was not showing any constitutional symptoms like fever or any other features suggestive of involvement of the central nervous system. On examination, there was an ulcer on the base of the penis and this was painless. It was hard and indurated. Also, the local lymph nodes, the inguinal lymph nodes were involved. They were discrete and they were enlarged and painless. Vital signs were normal it is generally important to know before we make the clinical diagnosis consider the history in the patient in detail we have to take the present history past history the duration of illness painfulness of the ulcer or involvement of lymph nodes etc next comes the clinical examination details which will help us to consolidate on the clinical diagnosis to do this we have to have a clinical acumen about the etiology of genital ulcers as such. Let us consider what are the bacteria which can cause genital infections. So, when we come to the differential diagnosis, we have to keep in mind syphilis caused by Trypanosoma pallidum. Next is the chancroid, lymphogranuloma venereum and granuloma inguinal. These are the common ones. Not only bacteria, the viruses can also cause the genital lesions like the genital herpes, warty nodules caused by various viruses. Parasites can also cause the genital infections especially the trichomoniasis. Similarly, some of the fungi can also cause the genital infections like the candidiasis. So, we have to keep in mind all these etiological agents before we make a clinical diagnosis after taking the clinical history in detail and the examination. So, in this case, we made the diagnosis of syphilis based on the clinical judgment. Ulcers were painless and enlarged local lymph nodes were present which were again painless. There was no fever or constitutional symptoms and there was of course, the history of exposure to unprotected sex. Once we have made the clinical diagnosis, it is important to confirm the diagnosis so that we are able to initiate the specific therapy preventing mainly the complications which can be very debilitating. So, going to the lab diagnosis, there are various modalities in the diagnosis including the microscopy, direct examination and stain preparation examination. We can attempt cultures in some organisms though it may be complex or difficult, we can go for detection of antigen or antibody. 
and also direct immunofluorescence test can be used and many other molecular methods can be considered. This is a general approach. However, sample collection, the type of sample collection, the time of collection and the method of collection forms a very important component and determines the success of laboratory diagnosis in all the cases of genital infections. Not only sample collection is important, but how we transport the specimen is also equally going to play the role. Because these organisms are usually very delicate, immediately after collection the samples need to be transported to the laboratory without any further delay. So, once we have collected the specimen properly and transported it to the laboratory immediately, let us come back to our case 1 which I had described that the patient had come with a genital ulcer. In this case we collected exudate from the ulcer and also the blood sample. We have different methods for diagnosis of syphilis especially microscopy is important. These organisms which uh, can cause this disease are Trypanema pallidum, they are very delicate organisms. We can examine them by using dark ground microscopy and also by using specific stains. In this case the smear was made and it was examined by using dark ground microscopy. We could see the spiral organisms. The staining was also performed as I said these organisms are delicate, they are thin in nature. Stainings like silver impregnation techniques for example, the Fontana staining is usually preferred and the organisms are seen here as the delicate spiral organisms. Next thing was usually the culture of these organisms is difficult and not attempted. Blood sample was also collected as I said and we performed some serological tests like VDRL test and TPHA that is Riponema pallidum hemagglutination test both of them turned out positive in this case. So, taking the clue from basic investigations what do you think is a diagnosis? I hope you have guessed it, it is the confirmation of syphilis, the organisms Triponema pallidum were demonstrated, report was sent and the physician started with the specific therapy that is penicillin. Penicillin is a drug of choice in case of syphilis, if at all the patients are sensitive to penicillin, doxycycline can be used. Especially treatment of such patients in pregnancy is very important because penicillin desensitization has to be considered in such cases. By taking the example of this case, we have made the diagnosis of syphilis not only clinically, but microbiological investigations also supported the diagnosis. Let us move further and learn more about the disease, the organism, its nature and also some more tests which are usually to be considered in the case of diagnosis of syphilis. Let us learn about the organisms in detail, Triponema pallidum. As the name indicates, they are pale staining, pallidum means pale staining and tripo stands for turns or the spring and the nema stands for the thread. So, these are the spiral organisms, they are structurally complex as compared to the other bacteria. They possess the gram negative type of cell wall, however, they cannot be stained by gram stain and they cannot be visualized by light microscope. They possess endoflagella and they give the peculiar type of motility to these organisms and they move spirally by flexion extension and it is uh, specifically described as a corkscrew type of motility. They cannot be grown in any artificial media, however, the non-pathogenic strains can be maintained. These organisms are highly sensitive to heat. One interesting point about their sensitivity to heat is when we read the history of syphilis, it is said that in the olden days to cure syphilis, patients were subjected to the biting of mosquitoes so that they would be introduced with malaria as there is high fever and chills in malaria that would take care of these organisms and that was a treatment. However, it was not ethically right, but this was what was a treatment given in the earlier days as these organisms are sensitive to high temperature. They are also sensitive to commonly used disinfectant soap as they are very delicate and sensitive organisms and they are also sensitive to antibiotics and 
uh, detergents etcetera. The morphology of this organism they are very thin 0.1 micrometer in width and quite long 10 to 14 micrometer spiral. They are delicate they will have regular spiral in the sense one coil after other is placed exactly at, at the interval of 1 micrometer. They have tapering ends this morphology is very important because we need to differentiate these pathogenic spirochetes from the non pathogenic ones. The non pathogenic spirochetes also exist as the commensals in the oral cavity and in the genital area. Whenever we make the smear and stain it is important to understand their morphology of having the pointed ends regular coils helps us to differentiate them from the non pathogenic ones. As I said we cannot be uh, looking at them unstained under light microscopy. The stains which are used are the India ink Fontana staining. In Fontana staining we use the silver impregnation technique and Levadity stain is a similar one to Fontana staining which is used to stain the spirochetes pre present in the tissues. They are actively motile corkscrew type of motility is exhibited and pathogenic strains of Treponema pallidum known as the Nicol strain are maintained by serial passage through the rabbit testis. Treponemes have got very peculiar antigens they can be divided into specific antigens and the non specific antigens. Non specific antigens are also called as the reagent antigens such type of antigens are also found in the heart muscles of any mammals. So, taking the help of this similarity they have devised some tests called as the VDRL test and the rapid plasma reagent test to help us diagnose the disease rapidly. The reagent antigen which is present in the uh, treponemes is also called as the cardiolipin antigen which is diphosphatidyl glycerol in chemical nature. The specific antigens are of two types the group specific and the species specific type of antigens which are also being explored in bench top laboratory diagnostic tests. Coming to the pathogenesis these organisms are transmitted through sexual route and they penetrate intact skin or they may enter through the minor cuts or abrasions. Once they enter to produce the symptoms they will take about 9 to 90 days that is the incubation period of syphilis. Disease may be self limiting that may present only at the primary stage or untreated they may go up to secondary tertiary or quaternary syphilis. The clinical presentation varies primary stage if the patient comes it starts as a papule it may break up and form an ulcer. Ulcer is very typical as described earlier it is going to have a hard base or a indurated base and it is painless because it is painless most of the times the patients never notice about the presence of a small lesion and that is how this disease usually progresses into a secondary syphilis or further. It is called as a hard chancre because we have similar disease in which ulcer is painful and it is going to have the soft base. When the patient comes to us in the primary stage it is the best time to collect the exudate or the scraping from the lesion so that we will be able to demonstrate the maximum number of treponemes from such cases. The lymph nodes are usually they are discrete they are non tender and they are rubbery. It is also important to consider the nature of inguinal lymph nodes as we have to compare them uh, with the other similar uh, sexually transmitted diseases it will help us in the diagnosis. If the patient is untreated or the lesions go unnoticed it will enter into the secondary syphilis stage usually after few uh, weeks to few months the patient will start developing the rashes. The rashes are such that they will cover the whole body not even sparing palm and the soles. It is also considered as the most infectious phase and after the patient crosses this phase it becomes asymptomatic completely. Organisms would have entered into the deeper organs including the central nervous system, heart etcetera they will produce even more further complications. If the patient comes to us in this stage he will have maculopapular rashes including palm and soles. 
the treponemes can be also rich in such uh, rashes which turn further into ulcers sometimes and we can also take the material from such lesions for demonstration of treponemes. In this case the patient may also have the oral lesions, the oral mucous membrane is also involved and the organisms can also be demonstrated from such sites. In this case the patient may also start developing the granulomatous lesions on the face and on the other body parts usually the face may be involved. Having granulomatous lesions they may start as papule, they further enlarge, they break up and they may also present with ulcers. Not only the skin involvement is very much obvious in case of secondary syphilis, but mucous membranes of the eye including retina can be involved. Sometimes the meningitis can be seen in such cases and joints may also be involved. Going to the third stage or the tertiary syphilis, lesions are more of vascular in nature, they are more deeper, disease goes on for years, there may be aneurysm, usually the aortic aneurysms are common and they may be cause of sometimes the sudden death in case of syphilis if it has gone unnoticed or undiagnosed. Gamata may be present as I said mostly on the face or they may be present in the meningovascular sites. Tertiary stage can also present with neurosyphilis, Tabes dorsalis this is the due to the involvement of central nervous system. It can be general paralysis of insane, there may be gamma in the other uh, sites. Sometimes we can also see either in the secondary or tertiary stage the palatal perforation. Not only syphilis involves the adults, but if the pregnant women are affected with syphilis, they can transfer organism through the placenta into the fetus and child may be born with congenital syphilis. Characteristic clinical signs and symptoms in case of congenital syphilis are Hutchison's teeth. As we can see here, there are notched incisors. We can also see the saddle nose, frontal bossing, mulberry molars and also interstitial keratitis. Hence, it is important to diagnose the case early and treat pregnant women so that children are saved from developing congenital syphilis. We have learnt about clinical details of the disease. Let us now consider some of the other important laboratory diagnostic measures which can be done in case of syphilis. As I said, there are the modes of diagnosis are microscopic, culture, serology and molecular tests. We can directly observe this organism through dark ground microscopy. We have seen them in our index case and the staining which are commonly done are the direct fluorescent antibody staining which is very specific as well as the organisms are going to fluoresce under dark background and it is less likely that we are going to miss the organisms in such tests. Others stainings I have already mentioned. Coming to culture, I said that these are highly fastidious organisms and we cannot grow them very easily in artificial culture media. However, non-pathogenic strains are maintained in a highly complex anaerobic medium with rich nutrients. Pathogenic ones need the cells to grow, however, they are maintained by serial passage in the rabbit testis. Maintaining these two type of strains is very important because they form a source of antigen for development or for testing them uh, by using the serological tests. Coming to the serological test which forms the mainstay of diagnosis, we can divide this test into specific and non-specific test or triponymal and non-triponymal tests. The non-triponymal tests are usually easy, cheap and convenient because antigen used here is not really the specific antigen derived from the triponyms. However, most the similar one which is cardiolipin antigen which I said is present in most of the mammalian tissues. Alcoholic extract of beef is taken, it is mixed with the cholesterol and lecithin. This forms the base that is the cardiolipin antigen which is used in the non-specific tests for the diagnosis of syphilis. What are those non-specific tests? The non-specific tests are VDRL test, the venereal disease research laboratory test. This is a type of slide precipitation or flocculation test. 
this test make use of the cardiolipin antigen similarly the rapid plasma reagent test rpr test which is nothing but the modification of vdrl test rapid plasma reagent test has got some advantages over this we will discuss them in the next few slides the other two tests which also make use of cardiolipin antigen are kan test and the wasserman test kan test is an example of tube flocculation test wasserman test is a complement fixation test however both of these tests are not being used presently most commonly used non specific test is a rapid plasma reagent test one important thing we need to remember is non specific test are also called as the standard test although they are called as a standard test it is a misnomer we will look into the commonly used test that is the vdrl test vdrl test is a rapid test cheap easily available and it is very good for screening large number of samples serum here must be collected and it has to be inactivated and the antigen is the cardiolipin antigen needs to be prepared or reconstituted freshly every time when we perform this test and we are going to add a drop of antigen and patient serum subject the slide to rotations and after that we are going to examine for the presence of precipitates under microscope if we see the precipitate in larger clumps it is uh, considered as the positive vdrl test problem which we may come across during performing this test is a prozon phenomenon it can also be overcome by diluting the patient serum or we can also go for the quantitative vdrl test first one what i explained is slide vdrl test or it is the qualitative vdrl test quantitative vdrl test will also give us the titer and it is more important in knowing progress of the disease csf can be tested by using vdrl test however in rpr test csf cannot be tested coming to rpr test it is a rapid and most widely used because it mainly avoids the requirement of a microscope it is available in the form of a kit and a card is a given in the kit and it is very easy to carry out this test serum need not be inactivated what is the replacement here for cholesterol is the carbon particles the carbon particles helps us to visualize the positive test without the need for a microscope this is rpr test however both of them will have some inherent uh, false positive reactions or false positive test called as a biological false positive test these biological false positive tests are due to inherent nature of the serum or due to presence of some other cross reacting antibodies in case of leprosy relapsing fever sle and many other conditions vdrl or rpr test can give us biological false positive reactions so we should be very careful although these non specific tests are very easy and convenient they are not 100% diagnostic of the disease so we need to consider specific or the triponymal test for the serological diagnosis of syphilis coming to the triponymal tests or the specific tests they can be further divided into the tests which make use of the nicol strain that is a pathogenic strain antigen or the reters antigen we have only one test which makes use of the reters antigen that is reters protein complement fixation test which is not used nowadays coming to specific test which make use of nicol strain triponema pallidum immobilization test wherein live triponemes are added with the patient serum and we observe for inhibition of motility next we have is a triponema pallidum agglutination test quite commonly used triponema pallidum immune adherence test here we make use of triponymal live organisms and we add patient serum the antigen antibody reactions takes place these clumps can be further examined by dark ground microscope other tests which are very important in this group are the fluorescent triponymal antibody test fluorescent triponymal antibody adsorption test and triponema pallidum hemagglutination test tpha make use of rbcs as a indicator for presence or absence of agglutination this is very commonly used and quantitative tpha can also be done to monitor progression of the disease however 
as like any other disease ELISA is also available both for detection of antigen and antibody. These are some of the important serological tests which are available for the diagnosis of syphilis. A nucleic acid amplification test, DNA probe test and PCR are available. Until now we have taken an example of a case who came with the presence of genital ulcer with enlarged lymph nodes. We have made the clinical diagnosis of syphilis and also we confirmed the diagnosis by using laboratory tests and we informed the physician for going into a specific therapy. We also learnt about in details of the triponema pallidum morphology, its pathogenesis, clinical features, congenital syphilis and also learnt about more diagnostic tests. Now what is important is to consider few other similar cases we may come across so that we should be able to differentiate them. Towards this line we let us consider the case number 2 here. This patient came with a similar ulcer however the ulcer was painful here and the lymph nodes were also local lymph nodes were enlarged they were matted and they were tender. The patient had constitutional symptoms which was quite different from our first case. The patient had fever, chills and myalgia. Again the history of unprotected sex with multiple partners. Here we thought that this case could be a chancroid also called as soft sore because of presence of pain in the lymph nodes. Let us see whether we could confirm the diagnosis of chancroid in this case. The scrapings were taken from the ulcer in this case and lymph node aspirate was also taken because some of the lymph nodes were already ulcerated and they were open. Blood sample was also collected for performing any required serological tests. Scrapings were made into a smear, gram stained, we could see the gram negative bacteria. Organisms were having bipolar staining which was very characteristic and it is also very commonly described as a safety pin appearance. The arrangement also is very typical, chain or a row with parallel lines or parallel rows. This gives a typical appearance of rail track or school of fish appearance. Further we can also go for culture here. The media which are commonly used are 30 percent rabbit blood agar, enriched chocolate agar and the human clot can also be used. Once they grow they form a tiny translucent and pinpointed colonies on blood agar. The only requirement for these organisms factors X and V. X and V factors which are present inside the RBCs and they are more available in chocolate agar than blood agar. Here is a test which is showing that this group of organisms cannot grow in only if X factor or V factor is provided individually. However, they can grow when both the factors are presented. Now it was almost confirmed that this patient was suffering from chancroid caused by Haemophilus ducri. Haemophilus ducri is a gram negative organism very tiny gram almost cocobacillary in nature. They form the soft sore it in contrast to the syphilitic ulcer. Treatment in these cases is erythromycin, trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole combination. So in this case we have studied disease chancroid caused by Haemophilus ducri. It is also important to differentiate this condition from syphilis. We have understood what are the differences and what major points we need to keep into our minds so that we will be able to clinically make a diagnosis also confirm it by using the laboratory tests. Let us take another similar case which can also sometime confuse us. Another case came with painless genital ulcer, enlarged tender granulomatous lymph nodes, patient had fever, chills and myalgia however to a very low grade also positive history of sexual exposure. In this case because the patient had painless ulcers and painful enlarged tender lymph nodes we thought that this patient may be suffering from chlamydial infections. Now in such cases it is important to consider the laboratory diagnosis not only for confirmation of clinical diagnosis but also for initiating the specific therapy because these are different group of organisms requiring different line of treatment. So let us learn more about chlamydial infections. Chlamydia they lack cell wall, they cause uh, most commonly encountered sexually transmitted diseases. They are more common in female, however most of them are going to be asymptomatic. 
very important here is they can cause lot of complications in females especially if when they cause the pelvic inflammatory diseases they can cause infertility and such other complications. Not only the genital system can be involved by chlamydia they can also involve the ocular infections can be there they are called as a trachoma and the neonatal pneumonia can also be resulted from chlamydial infections. Let us learn more about the morphology of these organisms. They are a very peculiar type of organisms. They are obligate intracellular bacteria. Uh, they were in the earlier days they were con confused for being viruses because they lack cell wall, they cannot be grown outside, they cannot synthesize their own ATP due to many other reasons. However, because of similarity to bacteria by DNA analysis they were placed into the category of bacteria. They are gram negative cocobacilli, smallest ever known bacteria which we think their size is almost equal to the largest viruses. The size is around 350 nanometer in diameter and they lack cell wall. They have a very peculiar type of life cycle usually which bacteria will not have. Chlamydia are different so we need to keep in mind about their laboratory diagnosis. Coming to laboratory diagnosis in the case which I had taken as an example, scrapings were collected from lesion and they were subjected to iodine staining and other stainings can also be done. What is seen here peculiarly is the presence of inclusion bodies are seen as the brown colored structures because they contain glycogen. They are also typically described as the Miyagawa's granulo corpuscles. Culture is difficult and it is very complex, it takes a longer time. They can be grown on only the cell lines or the tissue culture, McCoy cells are used, mouse cells can also be used and they can be grown on yolk sac as well. Serological tests are available which are quite convenient, ELISA can be done, complement fixation test, microimmunofluorescence test. A skin test wherein yolk sac derived antigens of chlamydia are injected intradermally and any reaction above 10 millimeters within 2 to 4 days at the injected site is considered as a positive test. Molecular diagnostic tests are rapid and highly sensitive and specific tests. DNA probe, PCR and chemiluminescence are available. So, this is approach for the diagnosis of chlamydial infections. How do we treat such patients? Azithromycin is the drug of choice especially when the patient comes with cervicitis. We can also go for ceftriaxone with metronidazole in case the patients are suffering from PID because metronidazole can also cover anaerobic bacteria which are usually the causative agent along with these organisms in case of PID. In this case in the third example we have considered chlamydial infections again the case came with a similar history of presence of genital ulcers involvement of linguinal lymph nodes. It is important to differentiate them clinically laboratory wise. Let us take another similar uh, disease and a case, uh, case came as a case of painful genital ulcer and enlarged tender inguinal lymph nodes, presence of constitutional symptoms and a history of exposure. Here we are thinking of another different diagnosis that is granuloma inguinal. Granuloma inguinal is also called as tonovaneosis. It is caused by Klebsiella granulomatis. Incubation period is between 1 to 12 weeks. Usually it begins as a small nodule or a papule and it can enlarge and it can rupture and present as a ulcer. The treatment here is tetracycline, it is given for about 3 to 4 weeks. So, this case was an example of granuloma inguinal. How we make the diagnosis here is microscopy. Organisms here are intracellular cocobacilli, gram negative capsulated non motile. Here we see the safety pin appearance also. The egg yolk agar can be used for growing these organisms and the Leventhal medium is a another medium. Serological tests are available as usual and the molecular tests like DNA probe and PCR are also available for diagnosis. So, making a clinical diagnosis confirmation of the clinical diagnosis by laboratory test is important. Coming to another similar last condition is patient came with the painful extensive vesicular labial and cervical ulcers, enlarged tender lymph nodes, 
lot of constitutional symptoms were present in this case. Patient gave history of having unprotected sex with the new partner and this case was diagnosed as genital herpes because the lesions were highly tender and painful, extensive and vesicular nature made us go in for clinical diagnosis of herpetic lesions. Genital herpes, what is the typical feature here is ulcers usually disappear before lymph node enlargement. However, sometimes these typical features may not be presented every time, we need to keep nature of lesions and the presence of pain other things as a diagnostic point. Herpes is also a very important viral infection caused by herpes simplex virus and complications are also known if they are untreated because the virus is known for latency, they may go in for aseptic meningitis. If woman is infected during pregnancy and we can get neonatal herpes. The laboratory diagnosis here is more in line towards the viral diagnostic methods. We can go for the shell vial culture. It is quite rapid, positive results can be got within 24 hours or we can go in for microscopy. Zang smear is also very popular and when we perform weaponicular strain on material collected from the lesions, we will be able to appreciate multinucleated giant cells. They are nothing but the intranuclear inclusion bodies. So, till now we have taken the example of five different cases and they presented almost similarly only with few differences clinically and laboratory diagnosis has really made a difference in diagnosing these cases and treating them specifically. Let us now revise general approach to lab diagnosis when we come across with any genital ulcers or infections. Sample collection as I said is important, the type of sample collection, time, its transport rapidly is really going to decide the success of laboratory diagnosis. Microscopy plays a very important role in the diagnosis. We can go for wet mount, dark ground microscopy, sometimes electron microscopy in case of herpes and the chlamydial infections, gram staining, gymsa staining, fontana and levadity staining, immunofluorescence staining. Direct immunofluorescence test is rapid, sensitive. Culture is also important in case if it is a bacterial because it forms a gold standard in diagnosis. Other tests are the antigen detection, antibody detection, antibody detection, non-specific tests and specific tests for syphilis as we discussed. Molecular methods like NAT test, nucleic acid amplification tests are coming as a very helpful tool for diagnosing such infections, very rapid and highly sensitive. So, this is a general laboratory diagnosis approach. Very important thing is to have a clinical diagnosis in hand and then correlate them with laboratory findings and give a specific diagnosis and help the patient recover faster. So, with this we have come to the end of discussion of the genital ulcers, their details of the organisms causing etiology, differential diagnosis, complications and the general approach to their diagnosis. With this we have covered important genital infections like syphilis, chlamydial infections, donovaniosis of chancre and chlamydial and herpes infections. These are acknowledgement for pictures which I have used in my slides. Thank you very much.